Good afternoon and welcome to the future and present of space commerce hosted by the American Enterprise Institute. It's been an exciting month for space enthusiasts of all sorts, from Richard Branson's suborbital flight to Jeff Bezos's recent launch, the era of private space travel has truly arrived. Companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin may be making the headlines, but they are far from the only companies involved in the emerging space economy. At the same time, NASA intends to continue manned missions to the moon with its Artemis program. Today, I'm joined by a panel of experts who study or work in the commercial space industry. We'll be talking about the present and future of space commerce from tourism to manufacturing and beyond. Each of our panelists will give us an introduction to their work. Then we'll conclude with a panel discussion and a Q&A. And the Q&A involves you. Please submit your questions on Twitter with the hashtag AskAEIEcon or see the event page for more ways to send in your questions. Again, that's hashtag AskAEIEcon. And now I will just briefly introduce our, our great panel. Uh, John Roth serves as Vice President of Business Development for Sierra Space, a subsidiary of the Sierra, uh, Sierra Nevada Corporation. Rich Bowling is Vice President of Corporate Advancement at TechShot. Mike Gold is Executive Vice President of Civil Space Business Development and External Affairs at Redwire Space. And Matthew Weinsroll is the Joseph and Jacqueline Elbing Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School. To start, our, uh, start the presentations, we'll hear from John Roth of Sierra Space. John? All right, thank you very much, Jim. I appreciate uh, being here today and, and having you all listen in on this panel discussion. We hope, it, uh, hope it's exciting for everybody. So let's go to the first chart and I'll explain who Sierra Space is because that's uh, been what I've been doing for the last month since we carved out the space business of Sierra Nevada Corporation into a separate commercial company that is going to be operating independently. And the reason we did the uh, move is we see a big focus on the commercialization of space and what we call space as a service kind of offering. Uh, Sierra Nevada Corporation has been a great aerospace and defense contractor. Uh, we've been uh, very happy to be part of that corporation, but it is set up more as a traditional aerospace and defense company. And we thought that because of the move to commercialization of space and moving towards a space as a service, as opposed to uh, traditional cost reimbursable type contracts in the space business, that we thought we'd be better positioned to be set up truly as a commercial company. Uh, so the biggest uh, effect that it's had on me is I don't have to wear a seat coat and tie now, as you can see. Uh, so that, that's one positive change in being a commercial space company. But all of the uh, product lines, the people, all the contracts that Sierra Nevada Corporation executed are being transferred to Sierra Space. So uh, we're not a traditional startup company. We're starting with over 1,000 people and a multi-billion dollar backlog of contracts, including our Dream Chaser commercial services contract with NASA for resupply to the ISS. And we are leveraging some of the breakthrough technologies that we're developing, such as Dream Chaser. And I'll talk a little bit more about our life habitat and how the life habitat is gonna play into a commercial space station. Uh, next chart, please. So what we're gonna to bring to the table is a commercial space company, a Dream Chaser, which is the only commercial space plane that can do a runway landing. It's reusable, uh, very versatile. We call it a space utility vehicle. Uh, not only can it carry cargo to the International Space Station, but it can carry crew. Uh, we're going to be completing development of the crewed vehicle, which we have a lot of people that have been asking us for the last few years, when are you gonna, when are you gonna finish that crewed vehicle? It's uh, ideal, it's low G reentry, it's runway landing. And part of our spinoff into a commercial company is our decision to complete that crewed vehicle and to be able to offer that not only to NASA for ISS missions in the future, but also for any of the commercial destinations that are going to be coming up uh, in low Earth orbit. And, and one of our uh, primary reasons for doing that is to create our own commercial destination. And you can see in the second graphic there, our life habitat. Uh, it is an inflatable habitat, it's self-contained, environment. Uh, it can be launched in a commercial rocket in a five meter fairing and then greatly expand on orbit uh, to give more than 300 cubic meters of volume uh, available. So it, it's really a perfect type of structure 
to use not only in low Earth orbit, which we intend to use it for initially, but also for habitats on the moon and potentially as a crew transportation system for missions to Mars. Uh, we developed originally under the Next Step 2 contract to support 1,100 day missions to Mars. Uh, so we've done all the design work needed to be able to utilize it for that. The third element there, of course, uh, is vertical integration is a very positive thing. And we have a number of the enabling technologies which allow us to combine the transportation through Dream Chaser and the destination with our life habitat. Uh, we can do our own environmental control life support systems, our own propulsion systems, docking, pointing control, uh, a number of the subsystems that are gonna be required to, uh, to do true commercialization space. So we feel like as a new commercial company, we have a really large range of capabilities and we're gonna be able to uh, be an immediate uh, player in commercial space. Uh, go to the next chart. I mentioned space as a service as a business model. And NASA announced uh, almost two years ago now that their intent was to turn low Earth orbit domain over to commercial providers. Uh, but they don't intend to do a traditional program where they pay companies to build a new space station uh, and then uh, NASA would own that space station. They're going to move to a public-private partnership kind of model that they've been using for the commercial cargo program and the commercial crew program, where the companies uh, invest heavily themselves in developing the platform and the vehicles. Uh, NASA provides some funding to do integration and to meet some of the NASA specific requirements that are required. But by and large, it's a, it's a commercial development. And then what NASA intends to be is one customer of many customers uh, perhaps an anchor customer because of the, uh, the budget and the reach that NASA has. But the idea is for the companies to invest because there is a commercial market. And, and so it's more space as a service uh, where NASA is buying services, whether it's cargo services to ISS or whether they're buying spots for astronauts on a commercial LEO destination. Uh, that's more the business model. And we're seeing that happen more and more, not only with NASA, but even on the DOD side, they're very interested in companies that see reasons to invest in a commercial business that also has applicability to NASA or to DOD. And then uh, NASA and DOD can be just one customer of many customers that are buying services. And we think that's a viable business model. Uh, we think that the company has to be set up to be able to operate under that business model. Uh, being a traditional aerospace and defense type model it makes it a lot more difficult, which is why we spun the company off and, and uh, intend to set the company up to operate very much on a commercial model. Uh, next chart, please. So as I mentioned, our intent is to develop a commercial LEO space station replacement to ISS. NASA would be a key customer, but certainly not the only customer. Uh, we also intend to serve the other ISS partner countries uh, Europe and Japan and Canada and other countries that have had the ability to access the ISS, but then also a number of countries that have not had the ability to access ISS. ISS has been a relatively closed community. Uh, there have been other countries that have been allowed to send a few astronauts, but in general, it really has not been a general purpose point of access for other countries. We think there's a huge pent-up demand from conversations that we've had with countries that aren't ISS partners that uh, we think there is going to be a, a, a very big demand for having access to low Earth orbit. The other thing that we're really uh, looking at is the number of commercial space businesses. Uh, we would like to be able to create a, a commercial LEO economy. Um, when we did an initial survey of commercial companies that are interested in low Earth orbit business, we found more than 200 startup companies uh, many of which have gotten equity funding, which means they have uh, equity financers that, that believe they actually have a good business plan. And that now may not be a, a viable market for a, a commercial space station, but we think in the next five to 10 years, that is really going to be developing and we, we will see uh, a LEO economy developing in space. And we're not doing this in a vacuum. We're involving an international team of companies, both US companies and international partners uh, for development and operation of the space station, but we are going to be doing it as a commercial business enterprise, hopefully in public-private partnership with NASA and serviceable by our Dream Chaser for a cargo crew. Uh, next chart. 
And this just kind of a snapshot where we see the commercial businesses. Uh, obviously, space agency destination is going to be the anchor and going to be the initial set of customers, but there's going to be a whole range of customers uh, doing satellite support, entertainment, uh, media, private tourism. Uh, we're seeing just a, a whole range of dis different business opportunities that are developing in low Earth orbit. And we've been reaching out to those companies. We're signing a series of MOUs. Uh, you might have seen some of the press releases we've done. You're going to be seeing uh, many more press releases over the coming weeks of companies that we've assigned, uh, signed agreements with. Uh, so we really are bullish on a commercial low Earth orbit economy going forward. Uh, thank you. I think that's the last chart. Uh, Jim, you're on mute. I was going. To, I was going to warn everyone to do that, and I did it myself. Uh, thanks, Sean. That was great. Uh, next up is Rich Balling, Vice President of Corporate Advancement at TechShot. Okay, great. Thank you. Just a real pleasure to be with uh, such distinguished fellow panelists. And uh, go on to the second slide there. So rather than destinations or uh, vehicles of any sort, TechShot really focuses on uh, what to put in them. And we, we, uh, are, we, we act like a startup in many ways, but yet uh, we, uh, we're a 30-year overnight success. We were founded in 1988. And our, our main areas of focus, and we'll talk about mostly the first two here, are um, equipment and services that enable biological and physical science research in space. That is, um, we, you know, we talked about one of the themes today is the, the future of, of uh, low Earth orbit research and manufacturing, but also the current state of it. And this is really, really important to us right now, providing these tools and services uh, to help others conduct research. Uh, and then obviously in space manufacturing is another major focus area for us. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, we won't touch on equipment and services for enabling deep space exploration. We're doing some of that now, just starting uh, some work on, in fact, the uh, soft goods for the new exploration pressure garment for, um, for moon exploration. So next slide, please. Again, we're not a we're a thirty night uh, thirty night thirty year overnight sensation of sorts, if you will, right? So we've been doing this a long time, and you're seeing a few images of uh, astronauts with our devices uh, in space. And uh, Senator Glenn there in the upper left was just a just a delight to work with, and uh, we've just we've just kept going. So uh, our our equipment has flown on suborbital rockets, you know, Dragon, Cygnus, shuttle and has been on station now since uh, 2012. Next slide, please. We call this our continuum of service, really beginning and ending with the customer at the top. How do they want their samples processed? What do they need? And, uh, and just continuing, continuing on, we're very vertically integrated. We do all the electrics, the electrical design, circuit design, circuit buildup, firmware, software, mechanical, everything uh, completely in-house. Plus we have a, a team of PhD scientists who work with our customers to sort of design experiments and research campaigns and, and then oversee their, uh, their execution. Next slide. Even have our own little mission control here uh, as, as others like us do. You know, uh, when the Cub Scouts come through on their tours, they're, they're hoping to see rockets and capsules and maybe an alien or two, but uh, we don't have any of that. What we do have is a mission control where we talk directly to the astronauts and sometimes it's great for uh, some of those, those kids uh, to inspire them to see us talking directly to astronauts as they are carrying out our work on board the station. And we control that equipment from, from our own payload operations control center as well. We have two locations headquartered in the uh, non-traditional space area of Southern Indiana, which is uh, we're located right across the river from Louisville, Kentucky. And we also have an office and a lab and staff at the uh, Kennedy Space Center as well, the Space Life Sciences Laboratory there. Next slide, please. Uh, think of us like Levi Strauss and company in 1853. Uh, denim and jeans didn't come around until 20 years later, 1873. So what was Levi Strauss and company doing? Well, they were selling picks and shovels, right? Um, now I'm not saying that TechShot is addressing a 
gold rush market now. Maybe it's a gold hustle or a gold shuffle, or I don't know. There's a lot of activity and, uh, and we're addressing that market by providing these, these tools. So next slide, please. And in research, we're supplying materials, again, equipment for all these different types of research, whether it's material science, bone densitometry, rodent research, you can see a lot here, including um, protein crystal development, which has been around for a long time, um, plant research, which is really gathering steam right now, and cell and tissue research and manufacturing. Next slide, please. Just some of our equipment. Um, we have four devices on board the International Space Station today, four payloads. We have our bone densitometer for uh, research with mice. So that's an x-ray machine for mice, drug companies and universities and NASA investigators um, pay us to x-ray mice in space. They, they tend to readapt to gravity pretty quickly. So for those that are working to develop new drug treatments for osteoporosis or muscle wasting diseases, we take x-rays of these animals in space um, and send that, send that data back down right away. What you'll see the ADCEP, that's the Advanced Space Experiment Processor. We have to actually have five ADCEP units, just like the one that uh, Megan MacArthur is inserting into the rack on this current increment. It's kind of a generic platform. Astronauts put in cassettes with, with uh, little mini laboratories in the cassettes and the machine processes them all without help from the crew. We kind of either it happens automatically or we do it from here on Earth. We have two of what we call the multi-use variable gravity platforms. Uh, on orbit right now. And again, like ADCEP, it's sort of a generic box. We leave it up there and then transfer the uh, experiment modules back and forth. And each of those boxes has two internal carousels and we can produce zero to two Gs uh, all inside on plants, fish, cells. We've even solidified cement at fractional gravity. Obviously there's no fractional gravity chamber on earth where you can do these studies. And so we know that zero G can be harmful to health but is, is the gravity on the moon enough to be healthy for long-term stays or the gravity on Mars enough to be healthy? And so we, our customers use MVP to do research at fractional gravity in space. And these, these devices stay quite busy. PONS in the lower right, that's the Passive Orbital Nutrient Delivery System. It's not the greenhouse itself there, it's the little plant pots that you see. We co-developed co those with Tupperware as a better way to grow plants in space. And then the, uh, We'll talk about more about this in just a second. The, the 3D biofabrication facility or BFF is a device we're using for research now and also expect to uh, use for production. Next slide, please. So those are, those are the devices that TechShot Design built, owns and operates, but through the uh, NASA Research Engineering and Mission Integration Services contract or REMUS contract, we manage the uh, advanced plant habitat on board, on board the station, manage the science, let's say, on board. So there's a bumper crop of radishes growing there with Kate and uh, are growing some chili peppers right now on orbit. Uh, next slide, please. Also through Remus, we manage the, uh, the, actually the payloads and the science going on inside uh, two of NASA's research furnaces. Next slide, please. Okay, in space manufacturing, next slide, please. So the, the biggest thing we've ever built, uh, this is called Fab Lab, the fabrication laboratory, and it's really focused on manufacturing really high strength parts, typically out of titanium for, for exploration purposes. Most of everything I've shown you so far typically has an off the earth, for the earth um, purpose. This is one example that's really uh, space centric for exploration. Uh, this is a way to you not only make these high strength uh, metal parts, but also to uh, 3D print whole electronic assemblies. And we're about halfway through that and should be deployed to station first for testing and then uh, the gateways where uh, it's NASA intends it to go. Next slide, please. Also in in-space manufacturing, we have a newer project called the Pharmaceutical In-Space Laboratory or PIL. First rule of space payload development is pick a cool acronym and so this is a way to literally make drugs or drug components in space. We're working closely with Merck right now and really focusing on developing crystalline forms of drugs in space. Next slide, please. Cell factory is a really a complement for the next thing we're gonna see, the, the bioprinter. 
this is a way for us to take uh, a patient's own blood or skin cell skull, uh, samples into space, drive them backwards in this device into an induced pluripotent stem cell, uh, and then make a lot of them, billions of them, and then drive them forward again to the various different types of cells that you need if you're going to bioprint a uh, thick human tissue. Uh, so obviously you see a rendering, not a real, not a real prototype here yet, here yet, because this is sort of the uh, least mature of the technologies, but it is in work and we expect to test it within the next 18 months in space. Next slide, please. I think what gets the most attention for us right now, it seems, uh, would be our bioprinter, the BFF. And there you can see uh, astronaut uh, Jessica Muir setting up BFF for a test print run. And uh, we think it's we think it could be those genes that Eli, Eli, Eli Lilly, I've got Lilly on the brain, uh, um, uh, Levi Strauss. Levi Strauss uh, in 1873 really came up with that product that eclipsed anything he'd ever done with picks and shovels, right? And, and so I think potentially the BFF for us is that is that denim jeans discovery uh, product. We we think that the uh, the picks and shovels um, and exploration or experimentation campaign business for us that side of the house is going to be important for a really long time, but it could be this manufacturing piece that I guess we'll, uh, we'll talk about more today that I think could eclipse everything we've done perhaps so far. So thanks for letting me uh, talk a little bit about TechShot and describe a little bit about uh, what we find interesting and, uh, and perhaps maybe what we, where we think our place is in this future low earth orbit economy. Thanks. Great. Thanks a lot, Rich. That was wonderful. Uh, next up, Mike Gold, Executive Vice President of Civil Space Business Development and External Affairs at Redwire Space. Thank you so much, Jim, and uh, really appreciate you and AEI giving us this opportunity to discuss Redwire and the amazing future I think we all have in commercial space and space moving forward. Uh, just to say a quick few words about what Redwire is, you can see that we have facilities and offices across the United States. Uh, if I can, yeah, stick with that slide for one second. Um, we are comprised of several companies that have decades and decades of experience in space. We are building a company that is going to have and has tremendous heritage, tremendous capabilities, but remains flexible and agile and can conduct firm fixed price contracts, which uh, forgive me as a recovering lawyer, I think is really important to their future of space to be able to operate in an efficient, flexible and firm fixed price capability. So you see many of the companies uh, that we are part of the Redwire family, deployable space systems, which I'll talk more about in a moment, made in space, uh, where we have our in-space manufacturing, similar in uh, many ways to what we're talking about with TechShot, uh, Rocor with deployable systems, deep space systems that manufactures the cameras to allow us to view this incredible journey to space, uh, AdCol, Sun Sensors, Star Trackers, uh, again, some terrific capabilities to build. Uh, and I'll just continue the theme of picks and shovels to enable uh, the new space revolution. Next slide, please. And here are some of our core capabilities and areas. Again, I'll talk more about each of them, uh, orbital servicing, assembly, and manufacturing. We're going to be taking activities that were once done on Earth and moving them into space. LEO commercialization, we've seen the commercialization with transportation of cargo and now crew to low Earth orbit. And we're going to be continuing that and accelerating it to the platform. We hope in support and working with John Roth and Sierra Space. Digitally engineered spacecraft. This is, a, again, a revolution that's occurring within our industry that will substantially bolster our ability to design spacecraft in an efficient, safe fashion. Space domain awareness and resiliency, it's becoming far more crowded up there and contested. So there's just isn't a, a more important capability out there today that they're working on, as well as the advanced sensors and components that are necessary to support all of these areas. Next slide, please. 
So I can talk about it, but a picture says a thousand words and a video even more. These are our IROSAs, the roll-out solar rays that were built by deployable space systems out in Galeta, California. And the concept, as you see here, are arrays that are rolled up like a carpet in the rocket fairing. And then once deployed, again, like a carpet, they expand out. Uh, these deployable systems are a terrific next generation capability that will enable uh, the gold rush that Rich referred to before. And we talk about picks and shovels. I don't know if I'm pushing the analogy too far, but uh, you've got coal. Everyone needs power, and that's what these arrays will be providing. So terrific capabilities that are now being demonstrated on the International Space Station today. Uh, we're certainly hoping to build more for the power and propulsion element as we go beyond low Earth orbit to the moon. This technology will be just as applicable even for the lunar surface and as we go on to Mars and for commercial systems. We've got smaller versions of this array technology that can help support commercial satellites as well. So a terrific innovation that's relevant across the board and can provide the energy that will fuel this new space economy and new space activities. Next slide, please. Beyond that, we are coming to an era that is merging robotics with satellites to create something completely new and completely innovative. And here you see a image of our Arcanaut satellite, which is a satellite system that will literally build itself that we have an array of capabilities at Redwire where we will use robotics as well as 3D printing systems for satellites that construct and build themselves in orbit, allowing for far larger and more capable structures than you could ever launch if you were just using traditional technologies. What we're here to do at Redwire is to free humanity from the tyranny of the rocket fairing, that with these deployable systems like IROSA and satellites that build themselves like Arcanaut, we no longer have to be contained by what the rocket fairing can accommodate. Now we can launch a system that can again build gigantic structures that will change the way we use satellites and space systems in ways that frankly, we probably can't even imagine right now. So we're extremely excited about this next logical evolution. And going back to IROSA, now we've got deployable systems that roll out, but in the future, we'll have printers that will be capable of building their own solar arrays out of printer systems, uh, booms and reflector dishes. It's an amazing future in orbital servicing and manufacturing. We're very excited to be leading the way at Redwire. Next slide, please. And we certainly hope, by the way, John, that those solar rays that were on the life habitat are the IROS. So uh, I'm sure that was on there on the slide, and, and we appreciate it. And you know, are very supportive of the Sierra Space vision generally, which we think is just uh, fantastic and so important that we're getting into this new era of commercial LEO development that again, with COTS and CRS, there were programs that commercialized both cargo and now crew transportation. And now we're taking what I think is an even more important step where we're actually commercializing the platform for LEO activities that will allow, I believe, for far more innovation, far more international participation that will only help to improve life here on Earth. Uh, much like TechShot, and I really compliment them for focusing in this area that's so important, we need to make sure that there's sufficient demand for LEO activities. Uh, we at Redwire have flown, I believe, the most printers ever on the ISS, and we've got industrial crystal growth printers. Again, looking at how crystals grown in space can change the game for crystal utilization and industrial capacity here on Earth. Additive manufacturing, again, like was described in TechShot, where you can build tools that can assist you and will be critical, particularly as humanity goes into deep space. That very important for LEO, even more important on the moon, and I believe will be a necessity as we go forward to Mars, because you can't bring the whole hardware store with you. Additionally, Z-Blan and fiber optics, we're looking at 
a whole new arena in microgravity for manufacturing new substances, conducting new scientific experiments, and next generation fiber optics will be a big part of that. Our polymer recycler that will allow you to take plastics, et cetera, and reuse them, which will be so important for deep space missions. Uh, stereolithography and ceramics manufacturing, again, all kinds of new substances we can build. And then the modular regolith extruder, which will literally form the building blocks of bases on the moon. So this kind of printing activity is just going to be critical. And again, I applaud you know, our colleagues at TechShot for looking at biotech and where that can go. We are just at the beginning of the microgravity revolution. And I strongly believe that the companies and the countries that are the leaders in microgravity research, development, and manufacturing will be not only the economic giants of the future, but the national security leaders of the future as well. This is just an extraordinarily important activity for humanity and America as a whole. Next slide, please. And as we look beyond Earth, uh, we're so excited to be supporting the Artemis program in a number of ways at Redwire and even more excited to get to the lunar surface. And as we do, that's where we see that operations like our regolith printer are going to be so important. We must learn to live off the land. I'm a native of Montana, and I can tell you the Lewis and Clark expedition that helped explore our state initially would not have succeeded if they had to bring all of their water, all of their air, all of their food with them. And no journey of discovery will be successful unless we can leverage ISRU, Insight to Resource Utilization. At Redwire, again, we're working on 3D printed regolith and really all of the activities that we're doing as well as TechShot and others, uh, maybe in the future on a Sierra Space Station, uh, will be very important to support future missions to the moon, as well as an eventual historic human mission to Mars. Next slide, please. And finally, again, as a recovering attorney, I can't help but note that as we move forward with these exciting new activities to the moon and Mars, we also need to ensure that there are norms of behavior that we as commercial companies and governments respect to provide for a peaceful and prosperous future in space for all of us. Uh, I left NASA not too long ago where I worked on the Artemis Accords project, and you see the principles listed below. And particularly for the private sector as we move forward, interoperability is going to be extremely important to create an environment that's conducive to commercial growth, uh, as well as safety zones, leveraging space resources, deconfliction of activities. If we follow these norms of behavior, we can have a future that is far more Star Trek and far less Star Wars, which I think is a future to be excited about. So with that, I'm looking forward to any questions about Redwire and the revolutionary new space economy, and I'll turn it back to you, Jim. Mike, uh, fantastic, fantastic stuff, super interesting. Uh, now we'll go with uh, Matt Weinsroll from uh, Harvard Business, Matt. Great, thanks, Jim, and uh, thanks uh, to AEI for putting together a great panel and to my fellow panelists for really exciting, I hope to everyone else out there too, really exciting presentations. This is It's such an exciting industry to be a part of. I'm an economist by training. I'm a professor at Harvard Business School, as Jim said, and over the last several years, I've been getting excited about the space sector, doing research on it, teaching about it, trying to develop the next generation of space leaders like the three that we all just heard from. Uh, and so hopefully some of you listening today will pick up that baton as well. I'm just supposed to give a couple of brief remarks, uh, maybe tying together some of what you heard. So let me let me try to do that with just two quick remarks. One is that for those of you who are either uh, have followed the space industry for some time, or maybe some of our listeners are newer to the space industry, I think it's really fitting that these three presenters talk today because they are each tapping into one of the most exciting areas, or three, I guess, in total, of the most exciting areas of what's happening right now in commercial space. So if we just go kind of one by one, if you think about Sierra right from the top, the idea of putting more people into space for longer duration more often, right? That the idea of, of an economy in space being, in fact, partly about people transacting with people in space and doing things up there that we value uh, either personally or socially. That's a huge step forward, as Jim said in his introductory remarks about what's happening this month. And so it's so exciting to see Sierra pushing in that direction, 
along with others. Um, if you think about TechShot, you know, one of the big problems for space for quite some time, or I guess challenges is maybe the way to put it, is where is the demand going to come from, right? Well, why are we up there after all from an economic standpoint? And it's, it's just wonderful to see companies trying to find new killer apps or whatever phrase you want to use for why, we're, why we want to be up there. And, and whether that's the BFF or something else that comes up, we're all looking for those. And so it's, it's really wonderful to see new things come across the pipe. And then with Redwire, in addition to the manufacturing that you know is part of their heritage and that they're pushing forward, like TechShot, I think another thing that's interesting about Redwire is sort of an economic innovation in space, which is that it's the conglomeration or the putting together of several different pieces of the puzzle. And we heard the word integration several times, actually, from the presenters. But that idea of an organizational way of moving the sector forward, putting everything together so that they can capture some of those spillovers across space business models that are sometimes otherwise hard to capture. So really exciting uh, group of people that have talked to us. And so then the, the second remark I was going to make, and then we'll get to maybe Jim and, and Q&A, is that I hope all three of these business models are fabulously successful. I'm sure we all hope that. But one of the things that's, I think, likely to happen over the next several decades is that many space business models will fail. Others will be big successes. And it's incredibly hard to predict at this moment which they will be. Of course, each entrepreneur tries to do exactly that. But in some ways, that's the beauty of the new the new space sector, right? That it's it's not a sector that is so tightly controlled that business models aren't allowed to fail. In fact, it is this more competitive um, sink or swim type of model. And that's probably how we get the innovation and efficiency that we all know uh, markets at their best can deliver. So it's, an, it's a wonderful time to be uh, at AEI and talking to these three and everyone who's watching about the progress going forward. So I'll turn it back to Jim. Oh, uh, great. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, let me start by, and again, uh, feel everyone can feel this free to, uh, uh, to, 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 ju to jump in, even if I happen to direct a question at anybody in, uh, specifically. Um, I was reading a, uh, a report from Morgan Stanley, which said the current space economy is about 350 billion. They think it's on its way to about a trillion over the next, uh, next 20 years, um, which just kind of gets me thinking about what is, what is the potential uh, for the space economy. And, and granted, as Matt said, we don't know what business models are going to succeed. And as some, uh, some of you said, we don't know exactly all the use cases. This is still obviously a very, uh, it's, it's, an, it's an emerging sector, but sort of financially, can, can we maybe get a couple opinions on what the real potential of this economy is? Um, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, 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 I guess I'll kind of start in the order we went with, uh, uh, John, any, any any numbers you can give me? Yeah, so you know, of course, we're we're a business, so we're always looking at uh, return on investment. Uh, we we're not uh, just magnanimous uh, doing this for fun. We've got to make sure that we can make a business out of it. Although it is very fun to develop a a, a space station in, in low Earth orbit, but yeah, we've taken a look at uh, all those studies. Right, they go any, anywhere from a trillion dollar economy to one point four trillion dollar economy. And, uh, and like I said, we've, we've looked at uh, 200 companies that have concepts for things that they think could be commercial applications in low Earth orbit. Some of them uh, you may laugh at a little bit and say, well, I, I don't think that's ever really going to be a business. But others, you can really envision that if they're successful, there's going to be a huge increase in, in what kind of business could be done. And, and things like... Uh, companies are looking at printing organs in space. W wonder if you could really print replacement organs in space uh, or, or create drugs that you, there's no way you could create on, on the surface of the earth in, in microgravity and the way that, that uh, protein crystals align in space that's so unique. Um, we really envision, we look at the market as an overall market capability rather than looking at individual companies. Like, like uh, everyone's been saying, you can't identify what killer app is really gonna be out there. We have more from an aggregation of what we think potential businesses are going to be. So when we were doing our return on investment model, for example, for the, for the space station, we took a look at, at, at different 
functional groups. So satellite servicing, uh, for example, is going to be one area. And there's a lot of things you can do. You can move satellites from one orbit to another. You can repair satellites. You can do orbital debris removal. You can build satellites. You can refuel satellites. So just in that one sector, there's maybe a half a dozen to a dozen businesses that could survive. And then you go over to media and entertainment, same kind of thing. There's there's probably six to 10 businesses we've identified, subcategories under those. And what we've attempted to do is project where we think those markets could potentially lead, assuming that there are some successful players. Uh, not all of them have to be successful. You only need a few companies to be successful. And we've convinced ourselves that there is a, a very strong return on investment potential from this market, uh, which is what is driving us to do the investments that we need to do to finish the crude version of our vehicle, because we think that people in space is gonna be a big component of that, as well as the business opportunities that, that exist in space. So you really have to take kind of a macroeconomic look instead of looking at individual businesses. And, and that's what we've done. Well, I'll ask Rich sort of a, Rich sort of a, ver, a, a, a version of that question. If, if we're talking about, uh, and, I, and one of the, all these areas I find super intriguing, which is one reason why we're doing it, but the idea of these sort of manufacturing and production facilities in space, once, once you move toward, I guess, proof of concept kinds of items, don't you need that? If any of, the, if any of these really hit, we meant the, a, different things, we're talking about organs and fiber optics, if any of these things really takes off, uh, to scale those up, won't you need more than one commercial facility? Are there thought that you'll need, you know, several or more if, if, you're, if you're really talking about producing something uh, in any kind of great quantities? You absolutely will need more than one one unit. You've seen you've seen our BFF. It's you know the size of a uh, three microwave ovens, if you will. Right? You're not going to need one module or one rack or even one module, right? You, you, who knows, you may have your own complete on-orbit manufacturing uh, station, destination for those sorts of things. And, and I'll add that we definitely will need um, a dream chaser to bring these gently back to earth, these organs and tissues back to earth where they're needed, wherever in the country that they're going to be needed. So, you know, TechShot definitely continues to follow with some interest um, the development of that vehicle. Uh, yeah, so it, you absolutely will need that, and but you know I want to set a, set a sense of scale on time too. Uh, at least for us, we're all impatient. We all want to see this happen today and tomorrow, and um, and we are one of those companies, obviously, looking at human organs and tissues, and and have done a ton of work on uh, finding out what what the market will bear in a sense, and and then just beyond the, even the technical capability. And um, it's a great way to wait, make a small fortune out of a large fortune <laughs> in space. And, uh, and we have so many hurdles to get over just from the regulatory standpoint. Um, and, I, and I think we can surmount them. And uh, I, I'm not sure, I think it's probably a, a taller hurdle than the hurdle of where do I build these? I think, I think uh, there are great um, companies who are developing these commercial low earth orbit destinations such as Sierra Space, um, but the regulatory piece is also super important too, no matter what you're doing. Uh, what if you just tell me just, uh, just, just for a second, Rich, about the regular, do you, can you identify any sort of specificities to any kind of regulatory complication or difficulty? Well, well for one thing, um, you, know, you can't really send an FDA inspector to, to your manufacturing facility. That's gonna be a little tougher. Uh, although some, some may be eager to do that. Now, you know, you can certify a process and it's just like what's happened with, with I think, in my view, the FAA and, and commercial launching. Uh, you, you've got to stand up a group within the FDA to really focus on um, things they've never seen before, things they've never had to think about before, and how can we all come together and create some new oversight uh, for this new new world that we're living in. Um, uh, Mike, did you have, did you want to jump in on that? Well, again, as a recovering attorney, I can't help but jump into a regulatory discussion. <laughs> I and so. just one other issue that's out there 
is, and everyone take a sip of coffee, the Article 6 topic. This is Article 6 of the Outer Space Treaty that requires nations to both authorize and continually supervise the activities of the private sector. We're good at authorization uh, here in the U.S., um, but have been challenges ahead of us with the continuing supervision. It's very important for Congress and the executive branch to provide clear direction in terms of which agency is providing that direction. And can you still hear me? I've had a little yep. bit of a freeze yep. on the internet. Yep, so uh, that's an important issue that we need to do address and should do so with alacrity to ensure that we don't have regulatory barriers slowing down these terrific innovations. You know, I also want to say a word on your first question, which is I really believe that if you look at a laboratory, let's take a terrestrial lab, and that the people working in the lab not only had to be scientists, but had to be the janitors and keep the laboratory going full time, you wouldn't have great science from that lab. And that's been the International Space Station, that our astronauts have to dedicate the lion's share of their time and efforts to keeping the ISS flying. Now, with commercial crew, for the first time, we're actually going to have individuals that can dedicate their time to microgravity research and development. And I think that's going to be a game changer relative to the productivity and what we can get out of these systems to say nothing of what Sierra Space is doing. And there's few things that are more important than actually creating a commercial platform that can accommodate and be tailored for these commercial activities. And I, again, I believe that we're just at the beginning of even understanding what the microgravity arena can mean in nearly every industrial sector, that with agribusiness, we'll be able to feed the hungry with new innovations uh, via what biotech was being described by Rich and others, we'll be able to heal the sick. And I guarantee that the applications that are going to be most important, we're not even imagining right now. So I'm really looking forward to what will happen. And then just to say a word about OSAM, and you ask about what the numbers are, we know there's a roughly $300 billion satellite industry right now. And we're going to look back on the days of satellites that were built entirely on Earth as the dark ages, that we will be looking at a future where everything is going to be building itself in space because it makes sense, it's safer, it's more efficient, it's more affordable. And that is a future that I think, again, is something to get very excited about. Yeah, and I'm grateful, just maybe to add a thing, uh, sure. Preval for our experience on on board the ISS. Uh, I mean, it's it's a it's been a great cradle for um, sort of nurturing, trying out new technologies. Uh, but just like a, a, a tech incubator in, in your hometown, where people can come in and try things out, you're really not going to scale there. Um, it's really not for that. And and so I I'm not. Uh, I'm, I'm quite optimistic that, that we can scale things that we we develop and we we discover on board the ISS because of these new uh, vehicles coming online. And and Jim, maybe I'll just jump in here quick too because I think you started with the question about the trillion dollar type forecasts. You know, I mean, if you if you just crunch the numbers, those are not e extreme growth rates, right? That's like a six seven percent growth rate or something for a an industry that has you know, a lot of risk in it, but a lot of potential. And I think as the other folks have been saying, it's it's a bit of an incremental process as well. We have all of a sudden totally revolutionized launch capabilities. Then you think about revolutionizing commercial space station capabilities, opportunities that seemed impossible suddenly start to become feasible from a business standpoint. So that sort of growth doesn't seem at all out of reach to me anyways. I think there's a good uh, a good analogy in terms of an inflection point. If you look just a few years back at how many total satellites were in orbit, uh, it was it was a few hundred. It was something like 300 satellites, you know, ten five ten years ago. And now you have literally thousands of satellites, and you have single constellations that are looking at five to ten thousand satellites. Who who would have envisioned that ten years ago? It's just been an amazing inflection point. I think you're going to see the exact same thing. Uh, in commercialization of low Earth orbit. Once you have a platform, you have reliable, low-cost transportation, and, and you're allowing companies like Rich's and Mike's 
to, to do the innovation that they need to do to create products that are going to really be huge sellers. I, I think you're going to see a huge inflection point. Yes, quite again, I'm, I'll, I'll direct it at Mike. Do anyone feel free to jump in after he answers? Because you were talking about, you know, clarity and direction with regulation. Uh, but what about clarity and direction with the government's commitment to space exploration. How important is that? Because we, at one point in the past, our government was all in on space exploration, then it sort of wasn't all in on ex space exploration for quite a long time. So how important is it that you have, that, that, that the government uh, is, is consistent? And how, I mean, I guess, how important is the overall development of the space economy uh, that we have a, a federal government that, that is interested in going to the moon and the Mars and, and beyond? Uh, Jim, it's extraordinarily important that the commercial space revolution, all of these terrific capabilities wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the government. And that's not just me saying it. We've heard Elon Musk and you know, saying that if it wasn't for the support that he received from NASA and DARPA, there wouldn't be a SpaceX today. So while there's terrific innovation and critical sustainability coming from the private sector, we must never underestimate the importance of consistent direction and support from the US government, particularly as a catalyst for innovation, which is exactly what we saw with commercial resupply services contracts and the COTS program before that. Uh, as well as acting as a customer for those services. So government needs to act as catalyst, as customer, and having a vision like the Artemis program that, again, is consistent and that we can support and that will create innovations and commercial sustainability along the way is vital. We can't go back and forth and we can't equivocate and terminate programs. And that's why I applaud what the Biden administration has done to support and sustain the Artemis program. We hope any future administrations will do so because you know this isn't just important for uh, America, it's important for the world, it's important for the private sector to be able to continue to innovate, to have that consistency and support, again, from the government as catalyst and the government as customer. One reason I, I, I asked that question is, I think generally the public is pretty unaware of what's happening now, both uh, the commercial potential for space uh, as, as well as sort of the, the more scientific and exploratory aspects. They seem unaware of that. They, uh, they see uh, Musk and Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson, and they, they view it as, uh, you know, as billionaires just going on a, on, a, on a joy ride. And there's always been sort of this latent sort of hostility. They, people just don't see what it's for. They don't, they don't see the economic potential. So I'm, so I'm wondering, do you think that message is getting out there about the kind of potential that there really is even beyond sort of pure science? Anybody can jump in on that. I, I, we still have a, a huge way to go in, in making the public aware of what is really going on in space. I, I see it all the time. I, a friend of mine invited me to do a presentation to a Kiwanis meeting uh, so I thought, well, this will be this will be good. I usually talk to space audiences and, and folks that really know a lot about what's going on. And here's a chance to see what uh, what the average people that are out there know about space. They were astounded uh, at all the things going on in space. Uh, they're still, I don't know, half the country still thinks the shuttle is flying to the International Space Station. I mean, they're very unaware in general about all the things going on. But when I talked about <clears throat> the move to commercialization of space and all of these business opportunities that are coming and the idea of putting up a commercial space station, the excitement in that group was, was unbelievable. We had probably 40 or 50 people there and they did not want to stop asking questions. <laughs> it, was, it was an hour long of questions about, uh, about what was going on. So I think if we could capture that kind of excitement in the general public, that, that would be huge for helping to push NASA and, and the government in continuing what they're doing here in commercialization and, and making this 
this vision of a commercial economy really happen. If I can just echo John's comments, I think we've done a poor job and need to be much more vocal, particularly outside of the space industry bubble, relative to how important space is to every aspect of modern society. When I was with NASA, I was doing an interview with a BBC reporter, and they asked me in the wake of climate change, don't you think it's important to focus on climate rather than space? And I had to explain, we wouldn't even know about climate change if it wasn't for the amazing capabilities and people at NASA and other space agencies that are leveraging space-based capabilities to understand climatology and what's happening to the planet and how we can resolve those issues. And she was calling me from a phone line that I'm sure was connected through space. So no aspect of that didn't have to do with space, but people just tend to take it uh, for granted. And again, we need to do a better job explaining uh, its importance. And as John described, when people hear about the Artemis program and they see themselves going forward to the moon or they see themselves working on a commercial space station, it does still inspire, but we just need to remind everyone what we're doing and the impact on their daily lives from medicine to machines, to agriculture, to jobs and economy and national security. We all need to be purveyors of that message strongly because in the end, if our public policymakers aren't hearing that from the people, we won't get the support and we won't get the consistency that we need out of Washington. I had some of those same questions about Branson and about Bezos. And you know, when I start to point out that, well, if you notice Sarisha, Sarisha Banla, who flew with uh, Richard Branson, if you notice she pulls a device out of her pocket, she's conducting an experiment on that flight right there. And it's uh, an agriculture experiment Right. And Mike, you talked about how things that we can learn, even in four minutes of microgravity, could lead toward ways to help improve food deserts, you know, in in this country and in, in neighborhoods around around the country, around the world. Um, and so these infrastructure, these um, systems that are being developed by these folks, um, sure, a few are going to use that for flights, but they've already been doing research on board these vehicles. And uh, without without the interest of Bezos and Branson and Musk, uh, we wouldn't be, I think, as further along in, in some of these developments. Maybe I'll just jump into, I guess we're all, this is an important topic, Jim, so we all want to talk about it. Um, I think your, your question is well poised, and one aspect of it that I also think of, so this is maybe a simplified way of talking about it, but sometimes when people ask me these sorts of questions, I, I talk about us going to space for ourselves, for our kids, and for our grandkids. And in the sense, ourselves is the role it plays in our economy and our lives every day, like Mike was talking about. And and for our kids, it's the sort of stuff about climate change and other major problems we know we face. We can't possibly solve them as well, if not from space. But the, the third part, the grandkids or beyond, is that, you know, in the 60s, there was a magic of space. There was a passion of space as well. And I think if you look at society today, the lack of a frontier on Earth is a, I think that's, I think that's a spiritual problem at some level for for people that they they want they humans love to explore and space does still offer that so being able to tap into that a little bit more which i know is what bezos and musk are and, and branson are trying to do so if we can also lean on that i think those three parts together could be really powerful you know the uh the economist for nasa uh, alex mcdonald has a has a great book the long space age and it, it, and it was really quite an eye opener to how long space exploration has been happening. And, and some of the same reasons that it was happening in the, in the 1800s, in the 1900s, those same two reasons cover a lot of the reasons why we do it today. The um, signaling value, right, of uh, I'm a, you know, look at my technical prowess as a, as a nation, um, or if you're a brand, you're seeing a lot of brand involvement on board on board space vehicles. They want to be associated with space. They want to be associated with this spirit of discovery. And so you're seeing the, the branding aspect associated with signaling, the signaling value. But then the intrinsic value of why we do this and what are we going, what are we going to learn? And I think we're still going to need those two reasons to support commercial Leo destinations and to support, you know, research going forward. And and I think it's important that. Um, if a billionaire wants to pay $55 million to go to space and take some experiments along with him or her, 
I, I still think that's an okay thing. That's a good thing. Uh, we, we've mentioned, uh, I'm not sure, maybe more than one person mentioned about uh, the, the number of companies uh, interested in, in, in conducting business in space. How does, how does that uh, play out globally? Are those American companies? And maybe it was 200 companies, maybe there's a lot more, but how, how, is, how does that play out in Europe, uh, in Asia? Is this primarily, are these primarily American companies interested in doing business in space or, or, or is this a, a global phenomenon that may, maybe is more, most active here, but it's really kind of active uh, you know, across the world? Yep, so I, I would uh, say what you said there at the end is, is uh, very accurate. I think it's a global phenomenon, but it's, it's certainly more prevalent in the United States. And one of the reasons is the, is the ac access to equity in the US. It, it tends to be much better than other countries, uh, startup companies have in terms of access to equity. And that obviously makes a big difference. If you can even get a small amount of funding, uh, a $5 million, $10 million start, it really allows you to start building a business. And, and I think in the US, there's, there's much more ability to raise those kind of funds. But I'll tell you, we found some companies in Japan, we found companies in, in multiple countries that have that same kind of innovative spirit and the desire to do the same kind of things that the companies in the US are doing. We, in fact, in, in Japan, we found two or three companies with very unique ideas about commercial businesses that they might be able to execute in low earth orbit in, in areas like entertainment and, uh, and, and, uh, and different kinds of tourism type uh, capability. So uh, I would say it's certainly a global phenomenon and, and we're trying to tap into that because we think to be successful, it really is gonna have to be a global movement. It's not just gonna be a US based movement. Yeah, I, I agree that it's a global phenomenon, but one that is currently being led by the United States. And the reason for that, I think, goes back to a previous question you asked about the role of government. Uh, for all the complaining that some of us might do that we're not getting enough support, you know, NASA and the Department of Defense, we've really seen our government agencies, and I think NASA in particular, focus on enabling commercial capabilities. And I think this is as important a revolution in terms of procurement methodology and policy than anything that will ever happen technically because it affects everything where NASA is looking not only to meet a particular agency need, but to enable a new industry, to enable new technologies, again, to be a catalyst for commercial change. And again, we saw that with the COTS and CRS programs to launch cargo to the International Space Station that not only did NASA get cargo launched, but it created an entire business ecosystem that spawned a new industry and brought launches back uh, overseas. So uh, the government uh, here in the U.S. has been very active. We're seeing other governments, you know, become that way. You know, frankly, we're fighting subsidies uh, in many areas, but we are seeing the innovations and the desire to participate that we've always seen in space, where it's always been an international program for the International Space Station itself, and all of the countries want to participate. And as John mentions, there's terrific innovations and desire to create new ways to be a part of the space industry that we're seeing from overseas. But America is leading right now, doing no small part to the way that the government has encouraged and supported it. And we need to continue and accelerate that so that we can get these new innovations, get these new technologies, uh, and ensure that we remain in the lead and that the future is even brighter than what we're envisioning now. Uh, we, have a, we have a couple of questions from our uh, viewers, uh, our, our, our listeners. Uh, one is a, a highly specific question for, uh, uh, for John Roth about the life habitat systems. What are those things made out of and can you hook them all together and make a giant one? <laughs> yeah, that's, so it's a soft good structure. Uh, like I said, it's an, it's an inflatable and we're doing this in partnership with uh, ILC Dover, who is our soft goods provider. And uh, we've been developing this for a number of years under a NASA contract called Next Step 2, which is funding multiple companies under various BAAs to do development of kind of game-changing technologies that are going to be needed for not only LEO, but the moon and Mars. And uh, yes, they can be, they can be uh, kind of ganged together. Uh, our space station concept, you, you'll see we have multiple modules. Uh, 
So the idea is that we're fitting the largest habitat that we can fit a deflated into a five meter fairing to give us launch options. Uh, we don't want to have to launch on SLS, for example. So uh, what we want to do is have the option to launch on any standard five meter fairing. So what we've do, designed is the largest structure that can then inflate in orbit uh, to 27 feet in diameter. It's a three story tall structure, but we can certainly have multiple modules attached to the space station. We, we've uh, thought all along that uh, the development of the economy is not going to be as fast as maybe some of us would like. Uh, so we had to make it expandable. We have to be able to grow to meet the growing demand of customers in space. So the idea is to have a backbone in space that we can add multiple uh, modules to. And, and we're not, we, we, we wanna go with an open system architecture. So those all don't have to be life habitats. Uh, we could have a company that's developing a hard structure manufacturing facility that wants to attach to the space station. And we're happy to let them do that. Uh, we want to be able to have everybody come and play. We want to use the international docking system standard. We want to use standard interfaces on everything that we do and be able to, to have other vehicles dock to our space station. It doesn't have to be a Dream Chaser. It could be a SpaceX Dragon. It could be a Boeing CST-100. We want to create an open system architecture because we think that's the only way that we're truly going to be able to have a commercial LEO economy. Uh my, I'm going to ask my final question now. Don't answer it. Think about it. The last question I'm going to ask is, what is this? What does the space economy look like 25 years from now? It was it was 25 years from the end of World War II to a man landing on the moon. So that's the question I'm going to ask at the very end. But before that, I have another uh, uh, viewer question uh, from Matt Weinzerall, um, who who's they said that many of these studies they think are are overly generous and how they uh, look at the projections of the space economy in the future. There's uh, the person refers to sort of double counting. How do you, how do, in your own classes, how do you teach these projections? How does one even begin to, to, to think about what, these, this, what the economy could look like down the road, a space economy look like down the road? Sure, so there is a, there's a technical uh, economist side of that question, I think, <laughs> which is if we're trying to actually measure the size of the space sector, that's, a very complicated thing to decide, which is lots of little choices in there. And double counting is for sure an issue, right? So anyone who knows, who's thought about GDP accounting knows there's a ton of issues in that. And this is just kind of a subset or a related set of issues for that. And so there have been careful studies done, which put the size of the space sector at more like a hundred and some billion rather than 300. So, you know, I think we can, reasonable people can disagree about some of those choices. The one thing I would say about are we over generous and therefore over optimistic is that the vast majority of that sector, no matter how you count it, as Mike, I think mentioned earlier, is still focused on the satellite sector, right? Like the satellites are where most of the meat is and most of the money is in the past and present of the space sector. And so, but a lot of the projections going forward are outside this, the at least existing satellite sector. So maybe they're about growth of the internet and how that uh, feeds through satellites, but they're also about the space stations and so on that we've been talking about in space tourism, where the uncertainty bands are just so enormous that I wouldn't really put a lot of stake in any particular one projection. Rather, what are the different possible paths we might think about? What is the what are the key steps we need to drive the trend lines up and not get too hung up on whether it's a trillion or a trillion and a half or 600 billion in 15, 20 years? That's great. Um, all right. Well, now, well now, now I hope I've given everyone enough time to think about that, about that question. Matt, we're going to, uh, I'll let you answer that last. Uh, we'll just go in the order. What is it again? So what does this look like in 25 years? That's a pretty good, uh, that's a pretty good chunk of time. Uh, you can talk specifically about your business, a broader vision. Um, start with, uh, start with John Roth. Yeah, I, I really see us having a lot of people living and working in space in 25 years, and not only in low Earth orbit, but I think we'll have a lunar habitat by then. Um, you know, our, our inflatable habitat, we've looked quite a bit at what it would take to have that on the moon. And, uh, and Mike and, and uh, Rich and other companies are looking at in, uh, in situ resource utilization. So how do you have those resources on the moon? NASA's looking at uh, putting nuclear power on the surface of the moon to drive uh, a, a habitat uh, economy. So I think in 25 years, it is not at all uh, out of the, out of the uh, 
imagination to say that we're not only going to have multiple space stations in low Earth orbit, probably in different locations in low Earth orbit, you'll have a moon base and you'll you'll be very seriously looking at going to Mars. You won't be inhabiting, inhabiting Mars yet, but you'll be looking very seriously at, uh, at missions to Mars. Rich, what do you think? I really agree with John. I think there's going to be uh, people certainly in low Earth orbit, and I, I think a really healthy number of people on, on the moon as well. And, you know, just like in 1969, who would have imagined a world with um, smartphones and all that those, all, all the, the world and the ecosystem built around things like that. So to, to a great extent, I, it's hard for me to imagine what that world might be like. I'm optimistic. I think it'll be a good one. But whatever whatever it looks like, whatever the details are, I think TechShot will still be there uh, helping people live, live and work in space, making them happy, healthy, and productive in space, whether that's things to work on, ways to entertain them, ways to keep them healthy. Uh, we're going to be there. And we're we're going to be a part of that. Mike, what's, what's, what's the vision here? Where is it going so to let me begin at the Earth orbit and work my way out. I think we'll see a satellite industry that is transformed, where satellites now, again, construct themselves, leveraging you know, terrific red wire technology, where they're building their own arrays. They're transforming themselves later on to serve different missions. And because of that incredible capability, we've avoided the problem of conjunctions and debris in low Earth orbit and beyond because of those capabilities. And then as we go forward to the moon, we see uh, space stations not only uh, in low Earth orbit, like Life Station, but we see them around the moon. And we see manufacturing moving from Earth into space. The space is no longer just a domain of communications. We're building things in space, whether that's Z-Bland fiber or organs like Rich is describing. Space has become a manufacturing zone, while NASA and the international partners push the envelope of exploration even further. As John mentioned, those inflatable habitats are lighter than traditional systems. They have better protection against solar flares and cosmic rays, so they're better for beyond LEO. And we're going to see those within that span. We're going to see those habitats and you know, hopefully powered by red wire irosis moving forward for historic first human mission to Mars to establish a colony there. And by the way, the Red Sox will have won 10 World Series in a row by then as well. So well, quick, the, quick prediction uh, on the sports the, scene. The boldest, the boldest forecast of them all. Uh, we'll finish with Matt and feel free to talk about asteroid mining. <laughs> I was going to talk about the Red Sox being from Boston, but that's okay. Um, right. So I won't repeat what the other uh, folks said. I think the notion of people, satellites at a whole other level, manufacturing, all being big stories going forward. I hope and expect that those are probably three of the key uh, areas of growth. Uh, so uh, two things that haven't been said as much. So one, Mike hinted at this a little with debris, which is I think, you know, from an economist standpoint, there's some big problems or challenges facing the space sector, both in terms of capturing positive things that we call externalities or spillovers across companies and preventing the negative ones from causing too much trouble. I'm pretty optimistic though, that those will get solved uh, or at least managed over the next 25 years in the sense that there's huge piles of money at stake in solving these. And there aren't that many actors. There are a lot of actors, but it's, it's still a relatively small industry that I think everybody wants to keep these things in check. So I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about those. And then I'll just throw in the last part, which I guess is a economist's favorite thing to say, which is I would be, not be surprised if in 25 years, the biggest story is something none of us have even mentioned today, right? I think that's, we, we always got to keep that in mind. So uh, I'll close with that. Well, that's, that's outstanding. Uh, let me just, uh, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed this. Let me briefly uh, thank everybody. Let me thank uh, John Roth of Sierra Space, Rich Bowling of TechShot, Mike Gold of Redwire Space, and Matt Weinzer of Harvard Business. Uh, uh, we're, we're, we're done. Thanks, and thanks to uh, the viewers. And please uh, go to our AI events page for other fantastically interesting events. Thank you.